Um, well, first, a, a much more updated version of this slide. Um, and uh, so it's, um, I'm going to try and give you a, an idea of what, um, what we can and maybe what we can't learn from the crown jewels. I should say this really isn't my title. I never come up with good titles like this, so I was really glad to be given one. Um, usually mine just say planets or something boring like that. Um, but here are uh, a few um, sparkling jewels um, for young exoplanets. And I'm going to really focus on not so much uh, you know, what, um, what the surveys have told us. Um, um, Beth just covered that. But I'll use primarily the HR8709 planets because they've been studied so carefully, um, and uh, 2M1207b, which often doesn't get a lot of, a lot of press anymore, um, but was one of the early planetary mass uh, companions found around a young, in this case, a young brown dwarf. But we've learned a lot about uh, young, giant planet atmospheres from that object. And so, oh, I have to use this. Um, so uh, in the first uh, dozen or so slides, um, I'll have to skip some because I have too many, I I'm going to give you an introduction of what uh, I think we can learn, um, maybe answer this question about how to distinguish hot start from cold start, which is a real challenge, um, and comment on this issue of methane and not having methane. Uh, and then at the end, I'll, I'll dig a little bit deeper into B and C and 2 and 12 and 7 B because they illustrate so many interesting things. OK, uh, so uh, just uh, later in the week, you're going to get more discussions about details of planetary atmospheres from Emily Rauscher and others and, and Jonathan Fortney about evolutionary models. Um, but I like, I like, I was supposed to give this as a more pedagogical talk. And so I really love, you know, as a, as a graduate student, I remember reading David Gray's book on the analysis of stellar photospheres. And in the, one of the first few pages, he has this great statement of what an atmosphere is. And it's this transition region between the stellar interior and the interstellar medium. Of course, we're interested in planets, so you can just scratch a stellar and put planetary interior in the interplanetary medium. But that's really what it is. It's just a transition region. And that's what we see when we, these, these pictures before, we're, we're seeing, well, these are heavily processed by people who want to make uh, fancy pictures for the internet. But when we look at these guys, we're looking at, we're looking at their atmospheres. And so it's just this transition region. And so it's very crucial that we understand how basic properties like mass, surface gravity, and effective temperature influence, um, influence that atmosphere. And then there's often, I find, a little bit of confusion between things that we call evolutionary models for giant planets and atmosphere models. Typically, when you go to the BRAF uh, or Burroughs web pages and download uh, evolutionary model, their table includes colors or magnitudes, different wavelengths. Um, and so I've made it this little silly cartoon that shows, hopefully, somewhat the pathway between the, what connects these things. So atmosphere models over here, uh, for a given effective temperature and surface gravity and metallicity, you can calculate a spectrum if you think you understand the chemistry and the opacities well enough. But you also get a run of temperature versus pressure. And I think Emily will describe this in more detail. And at the bottom of that, say, uh, deep down at 100 bars of pressure, you can get a temperature, um, a temperature and pressure for a given effective temperature and surface gravity, which is sort of the defining pair of quantities for the object, for the, for the model. And that's used as an upper boundary condition for these interior models. The atmosphere regulates the release of, um, of heat from the interior. And so it pl so plays an important role as a boundary condition. And then the interior models use that, but they also use the spectral information to give you things like colors and magnitudes as a function of age for a given mass, metallicity, and so forth. So you need the atmosphere models for the interior models. But the arrow goes only really one way. I don't need interior models necessarily to run an atmosphere model. I just need to you know, pick an temp effective temperature and a surface gravity and a metallicity, and I can calculate a spectrum. So if I understand that model really, really well, and, um, and I, I believe it uh, with great confidence, then I could, and I had a great spectrum of a young exoplanet, then I could infer things like effective temperature and surface gravity of that object without the need of an interior model. Of course, that great confidence isn't there yet. Um, I like to use the analog analogy with white dwarfs. You know, the atmospheres of white dwarfs, which are, a lot of them are pure hydrogen, have these really broadened, start broadened hydrogen lines. And from those, you can infer temperature and gravity very precisely. And so you can use an, you know, a theoretician's HR diagram, which is T effective and log G, and put objects on it and infer the ages and masses. 
but we're not there yet uh, for young giant planet spectra. And so finding young planets helps us calibrate those models and hopefully get us to that point. And so the pathway to sort of in interpreting observations can go in, a, in multiple ways. You can go directly from atmospheres to observations if you have good spectra, um, or you can go through interior models and try to do something that way. All right, you've already seen a plot like this from Beth. I have to stand back and kind of remind myself what I'm actually showing you. Sorry about that. So here are what Beth referred to and what the community often refers to now as hot start models. This is from Barafidal 2003. It's one of the most popular ones. Um, you, you know, our, you know, there are tracks from Burroughs and other groups as well, but you know, these, these often um, get used to interpret uh, surveys and so forth from a statistical point of view. And, and Beth showed the top panel, I'm sorry, the second panel, luminosity versus age. And this is often used as the, as the motivation for going to young. This is age on the bottom axis here, I should say that. Log age and giga years. You are here. Um, well, you're not really that old, but uh, the sun is here. Um, and then the four panels are effective temperature, luminosity, surface gravity, the logarithm of it. I al always use CGS units unless otherwise stated. Um, and, uh, so, and here's radius. And what I've done is I've drawn, uh, let's say you had a survey that uh, gets you down to a contrast that would be equivalent to sort of a Jupiter-sized object with, a, with an effective temperature of around 1,500 Kelvin. I mean, surveys can go deeper than that. But, so th this is a, a line of constant effective temperature, 1,500 Kelvin. And as you go to younger and younger objects, you're crossing different lines, which are different masses. So if you're sensitive to something that's you know, of that brightness and you go to younger stars, then you go to, to lower masses. And that's very important. And so, and then you, you don't change much in luminosity, um, because the radius doesn't change that much. But surface gravity changes a lot. And so you'll hear a lot of, in the um, direct imaging community, about trying to interpret, try to measure surface gravity from spectral features and so forth, because that's another check on the use of your, and, and planetary mass nature of your object. The age uh, here often gets sort of uh, pushed aside a little bit, but that's incredibly hard. Um, you'll, you'll hear a talk about how to determine the ages of stars, I think, later in the week by one of the experts, Lynn Hillenbrand. Um, but it's amazing how much detective work has to go into actually finding you good, uh, good stars for your samples. So this is extremely important. And often the larger error bars, so if you were to plot an object in this diagram, the larger error bars are on the ages than on luminosity. OK, uh, moving along. This is the, the um, you've seen a similar plot showing you the differences between hot start, these sort of diagonal lines, now it's log luminosity, log age again, um, and these cold start. And I, I should remind you that this, uh, you know, the Marley um, and Fortney uh, cold start models, I think Jonathan will talk about this more, um, isn't precise, and neither are, the, neither are the early conditions of the hot start ones. I would say that it's not necessarily true that the hot start models are really good indicators at young age for a gravitationally planet formed by gravitational instability. It's un these are often, they often start from an extrapolation of the stellar birth line to lower masses. And it's not clear that the planet birth line from GI or, um, would be exactly the same. And the, and the initial uh, luminosities from the core accretion process are heavily uh, or poorly constrained, <laughs> to say the least. So even if you could put dots on this plot, um, a, uh, so that's, the, that's sort of the, the implication, right? It's, oh, I, I can measure luminosity of a bunch of young planets, and I know their ages, and I can fill this uh, figure with lots of dots with error bars on it. I can distinguish between the, the two families, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I think you'll need to do more than that to actually distinguish between them. First of all, you wouldn't know the masses in a model-independent way uh, for most things. Um, I, I don't think you can use methane to distinguish between them. Um, there's all kinds of uh, issues that go into this. It's a word of caution. That doesn't mean I want to discourage you from putting dots with error bars on this figure. Please do it. Um, but it's just one step along the way between distinguishing between formation. OK, I'm going to skip that slide. And I have too many slides. So um, what I just did was I removed all the transiting planets from this slide. Um, so here is uh, log surface gravity and, uh, and temperature. And uh, the gray dots are objects, mostly brown dwarfs, uh, Y dwarfs. This is M, L, T, and Y are spectral types, those stars, uh, L, T, and Y type brown dwarfs. 
And there are objects out there that you know the surface gravity and temperature somewhat well. I've removed the error bars. There are error bars. But, um, and you can put them on this diagram. And then this sort of spider web are those Baraf tracks again, but now plotted as uh, just surface gravity and temperature. Because these are two things that you could, in principle, get just from the colors and, and spectra of the object. And so here are the HR8799 planets. They sort of fall in this gray box. You know, we would love to shrink those error bars, but it's hard, as I will go into in more detail. And here's another one. Uh, I always like this guy because it has such a convoluted name. Uh, it's one of the worst, I think, in terms of names. Um, anyway, it sits here. And you can see, um, so you're wondering, what, what are these lines? Um, so these are lines of constant mass and constant age. So here is a line uh, for 400 million year old and this is a line for 100 million year old objects. And these are lines of constant mass. High mass up here, surprise, surprise, because that's where the stars are. And then mass decreasing this way. This is 20 Jupiter masses. So if you could measure to a Nat Cybral effective temperature and surface gravity, then you could use these models and infer uh, their mass and age. OK. But then, of course, there would be a model dependent result. So you still need to check that. But notice, as you go to, you know, these models all are all star like. And so, you know, these are like proto stars here, of course. I like to show the hot Jupiters because they're hot for different reasons. Uh, they, don't, they're not, they don't apply to these models, but anyway. Uh, so you can see we don't have many dots in this part of the diagram, and, and it's hard because you need spectral information. But if you could, so back to this distinguishing between hot start and cold start models, if you, for example, were able to, let's say you had a cluster that was um, 100 million years old, and you knew that very well. And you found a bunch of planets in there for a variety of different masses, and they all followed this path, then maybe that would be some kind of clue that this, this, these evolutionary models are right. But if you had a cluster of 100 million years old and they, they all deviated from that, then that's also a clue uh, about the formation uh, process of function of mass, maybe. So I think this is actually a more important diagram than the luminosity versus age one, or maybe equally important. OK, what shapes your spectrum besides speckles? So Beth mentioned speckles are these things that can be bred and grown by your, uh, your image um, processing techniques. They're, they evolve with time because of breathing and instrumental effects. They also evolve with wavelengths. So if you took a spectrum, uh, speckles you know, make a diagonal slice through that, uh, which can add structure that you know, might look like methane initially. And then once you remove that, it looks nothing like that. Um, not that that's ever happened to me before, but just saying. Um, so, so there are all these things that you want. Once you get rid of the speckles and their properties, and these are the things I think you can hopefully try to deduce, things like what's the temperature, what's the surface gravity, are clouds important or not important, is, non is the chemistry in equilibrium or not, uh, maybe what's, uh, what's, what are the abundances of things like carbon and oxygen. How am I doing for time? OK. So uh, I'm going to quickly go through. I'm going to use brown dwarfs a lot because they're very analogous to the young, young planets that we, um, uh, we hope to find. That there's no, their uh, atmospheric properties um, should be uh, similar, uh, at least at sort of a first order. And so the first thing, effective temperature, this is a plot of, uh, from Sharp and Burroughs 2007, just temperature, but at a, a fixed pressure, one atmosphere here, um, and then log mixing ratio, so how much of something is there. Um, and so, and these are different curves for different uh, molecules, CO, uh, water is a little hard to see, and there's methane. Um, and so, um, when you move through, so these again are the spectral types, the star-like, and then uh, uh, warm brown dwarfs, cooler brown dwarfs, even cooler brown dwarfs, and you're moving uh, to cooler temperatures, then you can expect roughly from some simple equilibrium chemistry arguments that, okay, stars will have lots of, uh, of water and CO. Of course, hydrogen, molecular hydrogen and helium are way up here. Uh, don't, they're not, uh, just not shown. Um, but uh, so these are all the tr important trace species relative to hydrogen and helium. And so uh, at these temperatures, you expect CO and water. And then as you go cooler into the, into the brown dwarf regime, then, uh, and of course, in the M dwarfs, which are spectroscopically um, uh, um, highlight the presence of titanium oxide and vanadium oxide that eventually goes away by the formation of condensates in the atmosphere uh, that sequester titanium and vanadium. And then you have L dwarfs, which are still have CO and water. Um, methane is starting to creep up, but still not, uh, not really detectable, at least in the near infrared. Um, and then ammonia is also starting to creep up. And then you go to cooler and cooler temperatures. Eventually, you get to Jupiter, and you have this 
clearly a methane-dominated thing, which is what we see in, 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 in ammonia. So, um, and so this was when Beth was, you know, when you get into the planetary mass regime, initial expectations were that methane would be an important uh, opacity source in the near infrared. Um, but it turned out, at least in a couple of the initial rare cases, that they didn't show strong methane. Um, but I'll talk about that more in a minute. So just from effective temperature, you get a rough idea of what to expect uh, compositionally. And then, of course, those all have very strong opacity sources in the uh, infrared. And, and, and you can see this nice gallery of, of uh, M dwarfs down to Jupiter. Of course, this slope here is from uh, reflected starlight for Jupiter sunlight. Um, but you can see the strong methane absorption bands and ammonia picking up here. So those, all those things play a, a huge role in shaping the spectrum. Your statistics, when you try to, when you use those uh, evolutionary models and different, uh, which show you what the K-band or H-band magnitude will be for given masses at different ages, these opacity sources are affecting you know, that K-band magnitude. OK, brown, quick brown dwarf 101. Uh, here's a color magnitude diagram, brightness in J, increasing going up. Uh, J minus K color, uh, redder to the right. And so uh, brown dwarfs become red uh, as you go to lower and lower magnitudes or cooler temperatures. Um, but then something happens. Um, here's the, here it is in temperature. Uh, something happens around 1500 Kelvin. And there's this uh, well-known transition from L to T types because of something's happening with the cloud opacity. And I, because clouds play such an important role, I want to say a few words about um, why that is. And so, so you can make, you can, you, you, where these objects are on the color magnitude diagram has little to do with how the evolution models predict the evolution of radius with time or effective temperature with time. Where these guys land on the color magnitude diagram uh, depends on what's happening in their atmospheres. Okay? Whether the, um, and it's really two primary opacity sources that control that. One is dust opacity. Here I've just randomly plucked a model out of, uh, off my desktop, printed out the opacities for it. Um, so it's not important what the temperature or gravity is. What's important is the shape of the two different uh, plasticity sources. Molecules slope uh, the opacity, slopes uh, upward to longer wavelengths, meaning it's more opaque here, less opaque. So more light escapes at shorter wavelengths. So an object that's dominated by this opacity will be bluer than one that's dominated by this opacity, which is more opaque at shorter wavelengths. So I can make an object blue or redder by just changing the relative contributions of those things. So I can move, um, here are dots, real objects, as is K, uh, brightness in K band versus J minus K. And so I can move an object around, theoretically, uh, by just changing the contributions of those to opacity sources. So this clear one has none of that dust. The dusty one has a lot of it. And so it's over to the red. Does that make sense? So I just change the relative contributions. So I could do that, for example, by, by having a thick, uniform cloud that's thin, or I could have the same effect by having patchy clouds. It's kind of uh, degenerate in that sense, too. Um, and so, and here's a black body. I think it's useful to show what a black body would look like. Uh, here's another one in different J versus J minus H. And so the, the cloudy ones, so the, the clear ones, deviate significantly from a black body. And you can sort of see that here. The dust is much more gray opacity-like. It's not flat. This is a logarithmic scale. But it's not nearly as steep as this one. So you would expect an object dominated by this kind of opacity to be much closer to a black body-like than, than one that's got so much structure and so steep and non-gray, <laughs> so non-gray. Anyway, uh, so that's your uh, clouds uh, 101 and brown dwarf 101 color magnitude diagram. Is that, if there are any questions about that, just ask me at the end. Um, and so uh, the next, th next thing that's really important is surface gravity. I mentioned this before, that of the things that change the most in this diagram for a constant effective temperature, surface gravity is the, is a, is the next one. It plays a huge role. As you can imagine, you change the surface gravity by 10 orders of magnitude. You can throw a ball much higher up, <laughs> or you can loft things in the atmosphere much more easily, and those sorts of things. Um, also, uh, uh, it shapes your spectrum quite a bit. Here's a nice illustration of real, now real objects, brown dwarfs at different ages, very young uh, and to uh, much older. And you can see how the h band spectrum changes shape. This is, most of the action is happening on the left or blue side of the spectrum. And the slope is very steep. It's often called the sort of triangular shape or angular shape at young ages. And then it becomes flatter 
uh, as, you get, as you get older. So an H-band spectrum principle could help you measure the surface gravity precisely if you get a really, really precise spectrum and you believe your models really well. The reason for this is, again, just the relative contributions of opacity sources. This is a very similar plot to the one I showed before, but now at two different gravities. But I've added the continuous opacity sources, mostly collision-induced absorption from H2, H2 collisions. Um, and so that adds another thing that slopes to the, um, to the redder wavelengths. But at higher gravities, higher pressures, more collisions, that becomes much stronger relative to your molecular opacities than at lower gravities. And of course, if I move this to log g of you know, two or something, then this curve would be flatter down here. And so you can change your spectral shape uh, from triangle, which is much more like the, the natural shape. Again, this is opacity, so your spectrum kind of looks roughly like an upside down version of that, because where it's low is where the uh, flux escapes most. Um, and so there's a natural triangular shape in the trough of uh, H-band H and K-band. But that gets sort of smoothed out and rounded by contributions of dust and continuous capacity, which changes the shape. OK, skimming through, there's just so much to say, because this, you know, what you can learn from these things is so, uh, so interdependent. All right, the next thing, which is kind of complicated, but I'll try to just go through it with Jupiter as an example, is this idea of non-equilibrium chemistry by vertical mixing, which is affected by surface gravity, as you might imagine. Things happen with surface gravity. The convective, these things are convective down deep, and that rate of convective boundary moves closer to the photosphere as you go to lower surface gravities, um, uh, and uh, the ability to mix things becomes more efficient. Uh, Jupiter uh, should have, as I mentioned in that equilibrium chemistry plot, should have mostly methane. Um, and hardly uh, any CO, but CO has been detected in the, the atmosphere of Jupiter. And the, one of the arguments for how that happens is illustrated here. This is, again, that um, uh, mixing ratio of mole fractions. Now it's temperature as a proxy for height, so deep in the atmosphere to your right, upper in the uh, higher in the atmosphere near the photosphere. Uh, Jupiter is around 100 Kelvin, so the photosphere is, is over here, 1,000 Kelvin deeper in the atmosphere. If you go deep enough, eventually you know, you'll start to see measurable CO, eventually it'll creep up and become more than methane as you go deeper. Um, but uh, what's shown on the right are time scales. And so if you had a uh, chemical time scale for um, basically to reestablish equilibrium, if you were to bring CO from deep in and move it uh, up into the upper atmosphere, the atmosphere would take uh, you know, of billions of years to reestablish that equilibrium. So even if you have a really slow, simple, you know, um, process of mixing CO up in the atmosphere, it can stay there for a long time. And that roughly where that uh, quench is, or where we would say the uh, mixing ratio of CO would be, is where the mixing time scale and the chemical time scale cross. So you would go here, and you would say, okay, well, my CO is quenched here to this small value. And then uh, for reasonable estimates of what the mixing efficiency is like, um, you get a consistent number with what's measured in Jupiter's atmosphere. The same thing can happen in these young planets. Uh, and so um, you know, I, I, here's a really nice paper by uh, Hubini and Burroughs you can look at. There are others. I think these all are all excellent papers. I encourage you to look at these. Um, this isn't a new, a, new, uh, a new concept by any means. Um, but what's roughly new is how it applies to very young objects which have low surface gravities. And so what happens is, so in the dotted lines, this is the same figure as before. So this is equilibrium CO. Um, I'm missing a figure, sorry. The equilibrium methane, let's look at the green line, just for starters. Uh, equilibrium methane would continue up. Oh, no, here, yeah, here it is. The dotted line's right here. It would continue up, and you would have methane rich. And here's CO, you have CO poor. This is for an 800 Kelvin object. The photosphere is roughly here. You would expect to have very, very little C, um, CO and lots of methane. But, uh, and this is for a fixed mixing time scale of one year. Um, and if you were to draw those, this is a terrible, terrible figure. Sorry about that. Uh, those mixing time scale curves would go up uh, like this. And where they cross is where you would quench the values of methane and CO. And so you can see um, for the high, this high gravity case, you would still get more methane than CO. But as you go to low surface gravity, it's a black one, then you can actually flip uh, whether methane or CO is uh, is the dominant one. And this is sort of illustrated here. What's happening is the crossing point of CO and methane uh, moves in the opposite direction of the mixing time scale, I mean the chemical time scale. 
And so you can flip the, the quenching point and have methane be actually lower than the CO for an object that should have uh, T-dwarf-like temperatures. So this is why I think that you know, whether you have methane or not uh, isn't really a good distinguisher um, for the hot start or cold start mechanism. All right, moving right along to 2M1207B, uh, which uh, is the, really the first example of a lot of these things I've tried to illustrate. Um, low surface gravity having a nice H-band, uh, triangular-shaped H-band. Uh, it has, should have T-dwarf-like temperatures, but shows no methane. It's near infrared spectrum. It was a huge puzzle initially, being the first one of these objects. Um, it sat low in the eight, and so here's your color magnitude diagram, what you saw before. Here are some dots, and uh, it's an old figure, but still useful, I think. Uh, remember the dusty objects were going this way, clear objects were this way. 2M1207B sat in sort of relatively unexplored, previously unexplored region of the color magnitude diagram. It's low and red, but all the, previously all the brown dwarfs should have turned over in this direction. So initially it was thought that the colors, which look very much like a, a 1600 Kelvin L dwarf, something was, was blocking the light and, and, and systematically lowering the brightness and that its luminosity was, was incorrect, that it really should be up here. Um, but what I'm showing are different uh, tracks for changing the relative contribution of that cloud opacity. You took a, 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 a T dwarf and made it cloudier, so a 900 Kelvin object would follow this curve if I systematically increase the contribution of that dust opacity. So, uh, one of the big puzzles was, okay, here's temperature and uh, luminosity, and these are those uh, evolutionary tracks again. This is from Subhu Mahanti's 2007 paper, a very nice paper, uh, showing, uh, well, it looks like uh, the effective temperature is 1600 Kelvin from spectra. They had nice spectra of the object, its colors. Um, but it sat here, which would imply a much, much older age. The object, at 2M1207, is, is clearly a member of a young association of around 10 million years. So either the luminosity was wrong, which meant it should be up here, or the effective temperature was wrong, and it should be over here. So the way the luminosity could be wrong is by having an edge on disk or something like that. The way the effective temperature could uh, be wrong is just by, okay, well, you don't have the right amount of clouds uh, sort of contributing to the models that you're using, which was the... Um, but in addition, uh, so here are some... This is an old slide, so you can scratch the new. It's from 2010. Um, but nice spectra from Symphony. Uh, in black are the data, red are different dusty models. Concluding again, it looks like a 1600 Kelvin object. Even more stunning is the fact that you see CO so strongly out in the K band. How do you get CO in an object like that? Well, it must, more evidence essentially for supporting this edge on disk. Um, but as I just mentioned before, if you look at the non equilibrium chemistry, you can flip flop the, the, the dominant contribution, whether it's CO or methane. So uh, I'll skip that slide. So <clears throat> this just illustrates the sort of degeneracy between a 900 Kelvin, so T dwarf-like temperature, but low gravity, versus a higher surface gravity 1600 Kelvin object compared to the observations. You can get a cool object with reasonable mixing showing strong CO. Uh, you know, I don't do a great job of matching. This is from one of my papers. I don't do a great job of matching the H-band spectrum, but it's not horrible. It does actually a better job of matching all the photometry. And so what's more likely happening in this 2M1207B case is that the effective temperature was misled by our previous notions of what, uh, 10 minutes, thank you, um, our understanding from brown dwarfs and so forth, which, you know, if you saw CO, it had to be an L dwarf, not necessarily. Um, and if I can just, let's see, quickly jump back. Sorry, I hate doing this. If you go back, and one of the implications for that, uh, you know, that answer for 2M1207B, that it's actually a cool, T, it's cool uh, T dwarf like temperatures masquerading as a L type object, one rich in CO and, and uh, looking like a, masquerading as a much hotter object. This is sort of like having a, a fake ID or something, I guess. Uh, anyway, um, so it, one of the implications is that if you go back to, let's say you, you're down at uh, T dwarf. Um, if you go back to younger and younger ages, then uh, for these sort of T dwarf type objects, so things below 1500 Kelvin, these would be T dwarfs in this temperature range. These guys are older and have higher surface gravities, and so the non equilibrium chemistry doesn't flip flop. You still have methane, it still works. Jupiter is a great example of that. The vertical mixing process is working well, but you still have a methane rich object, so it's not, there's no ambiguity there. 
So these older, more massive brown dwarfs that in the T dwarf regime show methane, but as you go to younger and younger ages, and then into the planetary mass regime, these are all planetary mass objects, surface gravity drops a lot, which allows that vertical mixing to flip-flop the CO and methane contribution. And so, in effect, all of your really, really young planetary mass objects that would be in the T-dwarf regime aren't going to look like T-dwarfs. They're not going to show strong methane in the near infrared. There may still be strong methane out at the fundamental absorption that's around 3 microns, which is still a very, very strong opacity source. Even a tiny bit of methane will show absorption out there and not show it in the infrared. But anyway, so this is an interesting implication for that, that all your young T-dwarfs young maybe don't exist. Really young ones. Okay, so moving along to HR8799 planets, I'll spend the last uh, you know, five or so, six minutes or so on these guys. Um, so uh, here's where I should really acknowledge NASA uh, and Nexi. Um, I'm mostly a theorist, mostly a model of person, and the vast majority of the observations I've done have been done on this particular system, uh, and the, the observations have been provided by Nexi and NASA's um, uh, access. So I, oh, great data. I always look forward to seeing these letters from, from Don, hopefully saying, congratulations, you're getting Keck time. Um, and Keck is a wonderful telescope. So I really hope that that arrow that Gary showed earlier extends well beyond 2018 in support of uh, ground-based uh, Keck single aperture um, work. Uh, so this is the HR8799 system, uh, the uh, 20AU for scale here. The red boxes show the two objects that we've been focused on a lot using this next high uh, NASA Keck time to get spectroscopy um, and trying to learn a lot about uh, this planetary system. Uh, here in a, in a, in a very uh, densely packed, uh, information-rich figure uh, is the uh, synopsis of a lot of that um, time. You can look at recent GPI uh, papers, one by Jeff Chilcott that came out on Astro PH for beta PIC, and another one by Patrick Ingram that'll show actually spectra, K-band spectra, of C and D, and you can read uh, my papers in the hours and hours and hours of integration time and, and many weeks of observing runs that took to get these spectra compared to the sort of uh, you know, 30 minute uh, amount of time that GPI took to get their data. So the efficiency change uh, with GPI is, is amazing. Um, but uh, CAC, uh, this is all done with the OSIRIS uh, spectrograph on CAC, which is amazing, amazing instrument. Um, so here's B, the photometry, H-band uh, spectrum, K-band spectrum. In the H-band, where our T-dwarf would really show strong methane absorption, which is what Beth was alluding to in the, the Nikki uh, simultaneous differential imaging technique, doesn't show that very much. Uh, and then K-band also was, would show strong uh, methane as well. It also doesn't show that, um, which is very, very interesting, and, and evidence for both clouds and also this vertical mixing uh, non-equilibrium business I mentioned before. C, uh, uh, I um, will just concentrate on the K-band spectrum. Uh, also uh, shows no methane, and, but also, interestingly, at 2.3 microns, is this little drop here that uh, is due to, um, due to CO. Um, I'll just show this little uh, illustration of sort of roughly how the models are doing. It's not perfect. We're not there with that white dwarf analogy that I showed, obviously. If you've ever seen a white dwarf paper and how amazingly accurate the models fit the spectra, you'll, you'll, be, um, you'll be surprised. Um, but here, uh, showing a sort of combination of P1640 spectra and OSIRIS data and the, the spectral features. The models do reasonably well um, at reproducing the, the SEDs, and so you could infer something about the objects from these data, but don't go over-interpreting uh, and making your error bars too small <laughs> by any means. We're not there yet. There's still a lot of discrepancy. Um, uh, even for relatively high signal-to-noise observations like the 2 total 7 b spectrum. Um, so I'll skip ahead, and one of the things that I think touches on this maybe distinguishing between gravitational instability and the core accretion model is measuring composition. Um, so in the core accretion scenario, you can imagine planets forming in different, between different ice lines, and so the gas will have, uh, in the beyond the ice line, will have a lower, um, a slightly lower oxygen content because uh, there's more oxygen bound in solids and ice. And so that changes the CDO ratio of the gas. And so depending on the fraction of solid gas that you accrete during the core accretion process will influence what the atmospheric CDO ratio could be. 
And this is a nice paper by Karen Oberg that sort of describes in a, in a simple model, but, but powerful model, the range of C to O ratios you might expect. And the fact that it is a range is important. The core accretion scenario predicts that you should have a range including stellar, but also uh, non-stellar values. Gravitational instability, there's this nice um, paper by Helden Bodenheimer that sort of argue that the time scales just don't work out for you to have a lot of solid accretion post-formation. And so you should really expect that in that scenario to have a stellar C to O ratio. So if you have a non-stellar C to O ratio in your object, then maybe that's evidence for the core accretion scenario and not GI. So we, we went after this uh, with the H, uh, HR8790C C spectrum um, at the full resolution of the OSIRIS spectrograph, which this always blows me away. I know maybe some people in the audience are just sick of me talking about it. But uh, this is this hairy thing uh, is the full resolution. The previous ones were binned. The OSIRIS, resolution get, OSIRIS instrument gives a resolution of around 4,000. We bend it to an R of 100. Uh, GPI, for, for reference, is R of 50. Um, so 4,000 is, is huge for a, for a directly imaged planet. Is that my red? Three minutes. OK. So you might look at that hair and go, oh, that's all noise. Um, but no, it's not all noise. This is a zoom in just over a particular wavelength range. Concentrate on the middle one. Black is the observations. Red is the model. These are all CO and water lines. The correspondence with the model is fantastic. It's been continuum normalized because we were worried about, at that resolution, correlated noise affecting the relative strength, correlated noise from speckles and so forth, affecting the relative strengths of the lines. So we continuum normalized it. But all these tick marks are water lines, uh, CO lines, and methane lines. And we use this in a simple cross-correlation. You don't really need it to detect them, but shows the confidence that we detect uh, water and CO uh, and no methane. And so we placed a really strong constraint on the mixing ratios of those molecules and inferred the, uh, the C to O ratio and found it slightly, it's not a huge significance, but slightly uh, greater than stellar. And maybe that was a hint that it's formed by core accretion. We need to have a greater um, uh, spectral coverage at that wavelength range, I'm mean, sorry, uh, at that resolution to do a better job, or higher signal to noise, which I think will be hard to do, because um, we're sort of reaching the, um, uh, the limit of what we can do with OSIRIS. But this kind of thing, if we can, when we find these young planets with GPI and Sphere, if we can go back to them with instruments with higher resolution, cross-correlation techniques like this. There was a really great paper by Snellen et al. and beta Pic, which went and detected CO and beta, and, and beta Pic b using a cross-correlation technique like this. If we can start going after compositions, then maybe we can make that distinction between those two scenarios. So maybe I should stop there. Uh, yeah, I'll just show this last slide. This is a nice H-band gallery which shows off the new GPI spectrum of beta Pic b uh, rocks uh, 42 bb, which was shown in Beth's intro slide. It's a really fascinating object. Zoom to 7b, h right. This is a really nice H-band sequence. Maybe we're seeing uh, spectral evolution uh, from sort of hotter, more massive planets down to cooler, lower mass planets like uh, h 7 b I'll leave that up. Here are the references. Um, Jeff's paper is on AstroPH. You can read it and see uh, GPI. And then um, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Wait, I want to answer your, I want to make a comment about your first question about the surveys, uh, um, GPI survey and the Nikki and the Sphere survey kind of working together. There has been some discussion about, about that, but the target list for GPI is available, so you can look and see how it compares to the Nikki one. The targets are different. But GPI was sold as a statistical survey, not cherry picking, um, but trying to have a meaningful uh, statistically significant answer in the end. Some previous surveys, Beth did a good job summarizing them, or weren't so uh, useful in that sense because they were cherry picking, trying to find that one for, for fame and glory. Um, but GPI's, the planet survey is supposed to be a statistical survey to find planets. It's up to other people in the room. GPI is not a GPI survey instrument. It's a community instrument. You can apply through uh, NOAO time, through your um, uh, if, there, if your uh, country is a, GPI, a Gemini partner through your own um, Gemini TAC and use the instrument and contact people on the Gemini Planet survey team and we will help you. It's a complicated instrument, but we will help you. We have promised to play nice with the community and we mean it. 
So it's a complicated thing. The, getting the data um, uh, out of the instrument is not, not simple. Um, but we will help you with picking targets, uh, how to do the, um, the observations, and so forth. Invite someone from the team to be on your proposals, for example, if you think that will be helpful. But please, so if you wanted to go out and cherry pick, do it. If you think all the A stars have planets, if you think all the, uh, the ones like HR8799, which are these funny um, stars that show anomalous abundances, the, uh, what's the phenomenon again? I'm forgetting. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a Vega-like star, but it's also a Lambda Boo type star. Thank you. Um, if you think all Lambda Boo stars have planets, go after them with GPI. Um, just do it. All right, your question now. So the question is, how well do the models reproduce the spectrum of Jupiter uh, over broad uh, band passes? Is that basically it? Um, yeah. Yes, yes, and it's a good question. So, um, so one of the things we do, um, um, or one of the things that one-dimensional people like myself, uh, um, we assume this ad hoc averaging over the disk and that we can characterize everything with just effective temperature and gravity. But you're right, planets may have spots on them, their cloud cover may be patchy and so forth. Um, and so our ability to reproduce the spectrum of Jupiter, which is what you're asking by those kinds of models, how good is that? It's actually not that bad for Jupiter. Um, you can see in the literature model spectra that do a pretty good job of reproducing, for example, this, because it's so determined by the opacities of methane and ammonia, and the spot doesn't contribute that much to the overall surface area. But you know, as we've seen uh, recent, over the recent years, with brown dwarfs have been discovered to vary, some of them as much as 20%. Uh, Abhi Rajan is in the audience. You can, if you find him, you can uh, ask him about that. And so um, uh, if the object really is uh, at least two-dimensional on, on the surface in terms of patchiness, then yeah, that could cause a problem, especially for non-contemporaneous observations. When we infer photometry and we try to get a bolometric luminosity by looking at uh, near-infrared photometry uh, from G pi and sphere, and especially for a really cold object that might have a good fraction of its flux emerging at wavelengths not covered by sphere or GPI, how will that affect our bolometric luminosity? These are all things that make me worry about just putting dots with error bars on a luminosity versus age diagram and distinguishing between hot and cold start. I completely agree that it's, a, it's an issue. But generally speaking, um, you know, if it's um, not a super complicated one where it's you know, 500 Kelvin on one side and, and, and 1,500 Kelvin on the other side or something weird like that, um, except in those cases, I think we're not too horrible. That's a, that's a great question. So the question is, so I said no young T dwarfs, but what's young and what's old, basically, in that statement? I think that's what you're asking. Um, where's the line? I was very careful uh, in my paper to not draw that line, because I think we need more objects and a better understanding of the mixing process. And, and when we do the mixing, we have a free knob, which is the eddy diffusion coefficient, which I can change and move that mixing time scale basically up and down and have it cross anywhere I want uh, across the, the chemical time scale. So there's a lot of unknown in that. And so I can't really answer that question. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to say exactly where that is. But observationally, maybe that we will learn that. How's that for not answering your question? What label would I give it? I don't like to give labels. <laughs> you know, um, sometimes, and I mentioned this in a, a Leo conference in, ages ago in Paris, and I heard people giving talks who were looking for planets, but weren't finding them. They were finding brown dwarfs instead. And you could just sort of see the, or hear the sigh in them in their, ah, I didn't find a planet, I found a brown dwarf. It doesn't matter. Those objects are fantastically useful, just as useful as, uh, as your 10 Jupiter mass planet. Uh, in terms of, because really, what the stage we're at, every bit of information we get is just as valuable. So be proud of your brown dwarf. <laughs> so I would label it a brown dwarf. <laughs> what would be optimal? OK, so the, the question is, um, um, at, let me see if I can summarize that up. So the question is, um, basically, what resolution would I like to confidently infer the properties of young giant planets, given that most of the survey instruments that are coming online now are low resolution, and a lot of the uh, physical effects are kind of um, um, 
they're somewhat degenerate in some way. And so with, with a resolution like this, sure, I can see CO very easily. But at a resolution 100 times lower than this, maybe it would be harder to distinguish between those two cases. Is that roughly your, and your question to me is, what, what's the optimal resolution for finding planets and characterizing them? Um, is that roughly the, more or less? OK. Um, you worry about the atmospheres. At low resolution, there can be degeneracies. Because uh, you, as you saw in my dust versus molecule versus collision-induced absorption, um, some of those things can play, up, play upon each other in different ways um, that can mimic. Uh, and then with non-equilibrium chemistry, I suddenly said, wow, you can have, uh, you can have CO and very cool objects. And you might say, well, geez, uh, with all these free parameters, how can I infer anything without high resolution? Uh, I think this is sort of getting to your point, maybe. And exactly, and a lot of the action is happening in the regions where the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere is opaque and where the data get uh, lower signal to noise. Uh, so um, really, I think uh, the answer is that a lot more money needs to be poured into instrumentation and support of ground-based uh, observatories so that we can have both. What we want, I think GPI and SPHERE are really tuned appropriately for discovery, for exoplanet discovery. But I agree that trying to characterize those as precisely as I think you need to do, to distinguish between a hot start and a cold start scenario, for example, the RF50 is not going to be good enough for that. That's my concern. Um, and so what I would like to see are things like higher resolution. RF4000, I think, is good. Good enough. So if you can make a chip that's big enough, maybe it's the size of this table, so you can have integral field spectrograph, at R of 4,000 over the full field of view of, uh, maybe it's not as big as the table, but, so that's the limiting factor, right? You have a chip and you disperse, you know, the G pi field of view uh, and the sphere field of view uh, at every spaxel, uh, spatial location, you're getting a spectrum and you're dispersing that on the detector. Your maximum spatial and spectral resolution is, I think, I'm not an instrumentation person, but I think is defined by your real estate of your detector. Just as nothing is said. So I would love to see giant uh, detectors and beautiful high resolution spectra, but still have an integral field spectrograph. Um, I wouldn't want to just rely solely on single slit spectrographs uh, in the cross correlation technique, for example. Just because the, the integral field spectrograph, I think, to me, gives you so much more freedom to deal with other noise sources and, and characterize them. But, maybe, but that, again, I'm, I'm just a, not, I'm not a great observer or instrumentation person. I'm just, that's my feeling. <laughs> 